let's talk about how the CPU you're building in Logisim relates to actual CPUs with the x86 architecture. Here we have a very abstract diagram of the data path from your Logisim CPU. That data path includes a set of 8-bit registers, including the A and B data registers, and the program counter register that we call PC. When we start working in assembly language, we're going to use the IA32 instruction set, and so we'll be working with 32-bit registers instead of 8. Here we have a diagram of some of the important 32-bit registers that we'll be using when we work in IA32 assembly. Among the IA32 data registers are EAX, EBX, which we can think of as corresponding to our A and B registers from the homework. X86 has additional general purpose registers, including ECX, EDX, and more. You'll notice that the names of all of the registers start with an E, which is for extended, because originally the x86 architecture supported 16-bit registers that were named AX, BX, and so on. The E prefix refers to the 32-bit version of the register. Nowadays there's also a 64-bit version of the register, which is in fact much more common. And so the corresponding registers in 64-bit x86 start with an R. We'll follow the book and use IA32, the 32-bit version of the assembly language. So we have the general purpose data registers that act like the A and B data registers from our Logisim homework. We also have an equivalent to the program counter from our Logisim homework. In x86, the program counter is referred to as the instruction pointer, so IP stands for instruction pointer, which means the same thing as the program counter from our homework. The program counter and the instruction pointer registers behave identically. They always store the address of the next instruction we're going to execute in our program. We'll also be making extensive use of these two registers, the stack pointer and the base pointer. The stack pointer and the base pointer always hold memory addresses and tell us where the current stack frame begins and ends x86 has a number of other registers that we won't need to worry about for our exercises, but one that's particularly interesting is the flags register. The ALU that you built in Logisim outputs flags, like overflow and zero, that indicate something about the result of the arithmetic operation it performed. But the CPU that you're building doesn't actually do anything with those flags. In an x86 CPU, the flags that are output by the ALU go into a register called flags, and so there's some bit in this register that corresponds to the zero flag of the ALU. When the ALU outputs a zero flag, that gets stored into a particular location in this register, and other assembly operations can check that flag if they need to. Let's talk a little bit more about the role of the base pointer and stack pointer registers. The base pointer and stack pointer store memory addresses, so the 32-bit values that these registers are holding can be interpreted as an index into RAM. When we draw a picture of RAM, we'll put the smallest address at the top and the largest address at the bottom. The smallest address is 0, and the largest address is almost 2 to the 32. In memory, every byte gets its own address, but if we're working with 32-bit values, we'll usually work in chunks of 4 bytes, because 1 byte is 8 bits, so 32 bits is 4 bytes. That means that the addresses that we'll think about usually advance by 4. We have address 0, then address 4, then 8, then 12, written in hex is C, then 16, written in hex is 10. So currently, we have 32-bit values stored in both the ESP and EBP registers, and if we translate those binary values into hex, we get FF, FF, FFC8, and DC. The job of these registers is to store the bottom and top of the current stack frame. So what that means is that this address, FFFDC, is the bottom of the stack frame for whatever function is currently executing. And similarly, FFFC8 is the top of the stack frame for the current function. So we can think of these registers as pointing to the top and bottom of the current stack frame. This is part of the reason that we draw stack diagrams, is because this is how things are actually laid out in memory. When we're executing a function, all of the local variables are stored near each other in memory, 
And if we call a new function, the stack pointer and the base pointer will move up to make space for that new function's local variables. And when it returns, the stack pointer and base pointer will move back down. All of this is accomplished by changing the values that are stored in these 32-bit registers. We'll talk about lots more assembly instructions later, but first a few basics on moving data around. Suppose that the A register is currently holding the number 5, represented in 32-bit 2's complement binary, and we want to copy that value into the B register. We can accomplish that with the assembly instruction move percent %eax percent %ebx. This will move the data that's in the eax register to the ebx register. So we'll get a copy of that same 32-bit 2's complement binary value in the ebx register. We can also copy data to and from memory This instruction, because of the parentheses, says treat the value in this register as a memory address and copy the data to that memory location. So here, if we move the data that's in EAX, this 32-bit value will be sent to memory and stored at the location indicated by the stack pointer register. So the stack pointer register is storing the address FFFC8, and so we'll put the value 5 in this location in memory. We can also use a memory address as the source to load data from memory into our register. We also have a couple of special purpose instructions for manipulating the stack. The push instruction puts data on top of the stack. We can think of the ESP register as pointing to the top of our entire function stack. So if we want to put data on top of the stack, we need to move the stack pointer up and then put data at the new top of the stack. So the push instruction takes the data from this register, in this case EAX, and puts it one location above the current top of the stack. One location above in this case means four addresses earlier, since we're working with 32-bit values. So we'll put the data in the location above the stack pointer, and we'll also move the stack pointer to now point to this location, which means that we've subtracted four from the value in the ESP register. The ESP register currently ends with an eight, so we'll replace that with a four. We can also take data off of the stack with the pop instruction. The pop instruction takes something off the top of the stack, so it moves the stack pointer down by one and copies the data that was on top of the stack into the register we specify. So here we would move the pointer back down and copy the data that was previously at the top of the stack, this data here, into the EDX register. If this value had been 15, we would have copied a 15 into the EDX register. And again, when we change the stack pointer, that means changing the value that's stored in this register. So we need to change this back to the address FFFC8. So when we push, data goes onto the stack and the stack pointer moves up. When we pop, data goes into a register and the stack pointer moves down. Moving the stack pointer means changing the value that is stored in the ESP register. 